Mom, guess what I learned in school today? What, sweetie? I learned how a prince married a prince, and I can marry a princess. Think it can happen? It's already happened. When Massachusetts legalized gay marriage, schools began teaching second graders that boys can marry boys. The courts ruled parents had no right to object. Under California law, public schools instruct kids about marriage. Teaching children about gay marriage will happen here unless we pass Proposition 8. Yes on 8. Chris and Sandy, uh, one night after work, had to sit down in the family room, which they never do. So, of course, we knew something terrible was going to happen uh, or something really fun. Um, so we sat down and Chris was like, I was approached and asked if I wanted to be part of this case. And I'm, you know, okay, what case? And she says it was whether to see uh, if Proposition 8 was unconstitutional or not. But I would have soccer practice and soccer games throughout the entire week. Then also be playing club soccer. So it was basically, I would have to miss a lot of that. Yeah, and I'm a competitive fencer. So, you know, well, you associate the word activism with people who, uh, you know, with signs and, and not extremists, but people who... Well, when I think of Chris and Sandy, I think of, of people who are not humble, but, you know, people who don't want to force their views on people. I mean, we thought our parents were married. Yeah. That's how they explained it to us. So when we think of marriage, uh, we think of Chris and Sandy, we think of our parents. But I, uh, I know for a fact that there's a lot of kids in my school who don't want to see them as married. So what do we expect? I mean, I've, I've never been in a courtroom where my parents are testifying against their own government. <laughs> um, I honestly can't tell you, because I think they might be shattered with what's going to happen. Calling civil case 09-2292, Kristen Perry versus Arnold Schwarzenegger. Appearances, counsel, please. All rise. <laughs> On election day, 2008, Californians voted in favor of Proposition 8 thus rewriting the California state constitution to add a ban on marriage for gay and lesbian citizens who were already enjoying that right. Well, now two lawyers, most famous for representing opposing sides of Bush v. Gore, have teamed up to take Proposition 8 to federal court. Good morning, Your Honor. Theodore B. Olson on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. David Boyes on behalf of the plaintiffs. Chief Judge Vaughn Walker, a Republican appointee, agreed with Mr. Boyes and Mr. Olson that the case could be broadcast, but the defendants, the opponents of gay marriage, turned to Charles Cooper. Good morning, Mr. Chief Judge Charles Cooper for the defendant interveners. Mr. Cooper filed an appeal with the U.S. Supreme Court, which was successful, and the Supreme Court blocked plans to broadcast the trial, and thus, the nation was denied access to the testimony of plaintiffs Jeff Zarillo and Paul Katami and Sandy Steer and Chris Perry. But the transcripts of this trial could not be hidden. And on June 16, 2010, the closing arguments of this historic case commenced. These are the words, the witnesses, the testimony, and the trial the defenders of Proposition 8 have fought so hard to keep from public view. Uh, Mom. Mom, right here. 
Did you get through security okay? Yeah, obviously. So why didn't you come in with everyone else? They took us in a back way, around all the press. Did you talk to any of the cameras? Yeah. And? I just said this case is about us as Americans wanting to be treated equally by our government and under the law. We are going into court today with that simple request. You did it like that? <laughs> What's wrong with that? I mean, you seem really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, cell phones off. Come on, let's go find our seats. Wait, will we done time for soccer practice? I'm not sure. Come on, let's go. Let's go. What do you mean you're not sure? Well, well, who knew we were going to go through an actual trial, Elliot? I mean, who knows what we're going to have to do today? Because personally, I have never sued Arnold Schwarzenegger before. <laughs> now, move it. Obviously, the hiatus that we've had is not anything that I would have hoped for. But it may be appropriate that the case is coming to closing argument now. June is, after all, the month for weddings. <laughs> so I would simply propose that we get right to business. Mr. Olson, are you leaving off for the plane? I am, Your Honor. May it please the court. We conclude this trial, Your Honor, where it began. This case is about marriage and equality. The fundamental constitutional right to marry has been taken away from the plaintiffs and tens of thousands of similarly situated Californians. This state has rewritten its constitution in order to place them into a special disfavored category where their most intimate personal relationships are not valid, not recognized, and second rate. I'm going to, with your permission, Your Honor, play some excerpts from the testimony of the plaintiffs. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Would you tell us briefly about your background? I was born in Illinois, but my parents moved here with me when I was two years old. Well, uh, well, I grew up on a farm in southern Iowa, going to public schools. I am the executive director of a statewide agency that provides services and support to families with children zero to five. Now, today, you are in a committed relationship with another gay man, correct? I have found someone that I know I can dedicate the rest of my life to. And when you find someone who is not only your best friend, but your best advocate and supporter in life, it's a natural next step for me to want to marry that person. March will be nine years. Sandy and I live together in Berkeley with our children. We each bring two biological children to our family and each other, our two younger sons in high school. I remember the first time I met Sandy thinking, she was maybe the sparkliest person I ever met. <laughs> and our friendship became deeper and deeper over time. And then after a few years, I began to feel that I might be falling in love with her. And how did she feel about you? Well, she told me that she loved me too. We will be asking her to verify that. OK. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always an awkward situation at the front desk of the hotel. The individual working at the desk will look at us, perplexed. Uh, you ordered a king-size bed. Is that really what you want? And it was certainly an awkward situation walking into the bank and asking, saying, my partner and I want to open a joint bank account and hearing, you know, a business account? An LLC or an S corporation? No, not my business partner, my partner. Being able to call him my husband is so definitive. It's something that everyone understands. I'm a 45-year-old woman, and I have been in love with a woman for 10 years, and I don't have a word to tell anybody about that. The word marriage has a meaning. If it wasn't so important, we wouldn't be here today. It symbolizes maybe the most important decision you make as an adult, who you choose. Unless you have to go through that constant validation of self, there's no way to really describe how it feels. I love Jeff more than myself, and being excluded in that way is so incredibly harmful to me. I, I can't speak as an expert. I can speak as a human being that's lived it. Opponents of Prop 8 said gay marriage has nothing to do with schools. Then a public school took first graders to a lesbian wedding, calling it a teachable moment. Now this politician says schools aren't required to teach about marriage. Yet his official website confirms teaching marriage is required in 96% of schools. And a leading Prop 8 opponent has warned parents cannot remove children from this instruction. Unless we vote yes on Proposition 8, children will be taught about gay marriage. Whether you like it or not.
Your Honor, the words they put into the hands of California voters focused heavily on protect our children. Protect our children from somehow learning that gay marriage is okay, that there is something wrong, sinister, or unusual about gays, and their relationships are not okay and decidedly not suitable for children. For obvious reasons, however, the gays are not okay message <clears throat> was largely abandoned during this trial in favor of procreation and deinstitutionalization themes. And I submit that the overwhelming evidence in this case proves that allowing persons to marry someone of the same sex will not in the slightest deter heterosexuals from marrying or from having babies. Well, they have identified a difference between opposite sex and same sex couples in that opposite sex couples can procreate without the intervention of some third party. Why is that difference not one that the voters could rationally take into account? Your Honor, you'd have to make some statement that allowing these other individuals to engage in the institution of marriage will somehow stop that procreation or stop people from getting married or cause them to get divorced. If we had time, Your Honor, I could not present a more compelling closing argument than simply replaying the testimony in its entirety of the four plaintiffs. But we have so much more. There are eight experts, Your Honor, persons who have studied and written about American history, marriage, psychology, sociology, economics, and political science. Professor Cott, for example, an expert in marriage. Marriage, the ability to marry, to say I do, is a basic civil right. It expresses the right of a person to have the liberty to consent validly. And this can be seen very strikingly in American history through the fact that slaves lacked that very basic liberty of person to say I do with the force that I do has to have. And what happened when slaves were emancipated? When slaves were emancipated, they flocked to get married. It was said by an ex-slave who had also been a Union soldier, the marriage covenant is the foundation of all our rights meaning that it was the most everyday exhibit of the fact that he was a free person. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Cooper, you may cross-examine. In the 19th century, many Americans engaged in informal marriages, correct? That is true. And pregnancy or childbirth was the signal for a couple to consider themselves married, correct? Well, not always, sometimes. Uh, well, let's look at public vows. Your book, which has been admitted, page 31. Page 31, you said? It reads in part, marriage frequently followed upon a sexual relationship between a man and a woman proving fruitful rather than preceding it, pregnancy or childbirth was the signal for a couple to consider themselves married. You believed that when you wrote these words, didn't you? Well, yes, but as I said, frequently, not always. And you provided a statement to the Vermont legislature when it was considering same-sex marriage. Not to the legislature, to their joint judiciary committee. I see, and when you provided that statement in Vermont, the law that resulted was a compromise between Catholics gave something to Catholics and other conservative groups and something to the LGBT community. Is that correct? It, it did state in its first line, marriage is between a man and a woman. And then it went on to grant a civil union arrangement that gave all the rights and benefits to same-sex couples. Yes. Your Honor, we have no further questions. Thank you, Professor. A civil union? A domestic partnership would relegate me to a level of second-class citizenship, maybe even third-class citizenship. It doesn't give due respect to the relationship that we've had for almost nine years. Only marriage could do that. Husband is definitive. It's something that everyone understands. There is no subtlety to it. It is absolute, and it comes with the understanding that your relationship is not temporal, it's not new, it's, it's not something that could fade easily. We would love to have a family. But the timeline for us has always been marriage first because it solidifies the relationship. And we gain access to that language that is global, where it won't affect our children in the future. They won't have to say, my dad and dad are domestic partners, because truth is, not everyone knows what a domestic partnership is. We want our children to be protected from any awkwardness like that. We want to focus on raising our kids. <clears throat> I think it's quite clear that the young children do not aspire to be domestic partners. Uh, 
for young people, and, and certainly for people later on, marriage is a desirable and respected type of goal that if you attain it, it's something that gives you pride and respect. Dr. Meyer, as one of the leading experts on stigma and discrimination, do you have an opinion as to whether domestic partnerships enjoy similar symbolic and social meaning? In my mind, Proposition 8, in its social meaning, sends a message that gay relationships are not to be respected that they are of secondary value, if any value at all, that they are certainly not equal to those of heterosexuals. And, and to me, that's in addition to not allowing gay people to marry, it also sends a strong message about the values of the state, and in this case, the Constitution itself. Are you aware that same-sex marriage has been legal since 2004 in Massachusetts? Yes. Do LGB individuals suffer from a lower prevalence of mental health disorders in Massachusetts than in California? Uh, uh, well, well, well the, the first answer is, uh, I, I, I don't really know, but that's not how... Um, I wouldn't expect it exactly in that way that you're suggesting that that would be the test of that, because Massachusetts is not... Uh, an isolate of the United States. And certainly I, I, would, I would think that people in Massachusetts who are gay would feel more su supported and welcome, so to speak. But your answer is you don't know, correct? Well, well I, don't, I, I don't have data on that. You don't that. have data? No. Okay, right. okay. Do LGB individuals suffer from a lower prevalence of mood, anxiety, and substance use problems in Massachusetts than in California? Again, uh, I, I don't know of a study that compared California to Massachusetts on any of those outcomes. Okay, okay, and I was planning to ask you about the other outcomes, but the answer would be the same, right? Right. No further questions, Your Honor. With us today from New York and Virginia, we have Evan Wolfson, whose work is focused on winning marriage equality, and Maggie Gallagher, who is president of the National Organization for Marriage. <laughs> Now, Mrs. Gallagher, is it correct that you believe, here's the bottom line, <laughs> not only do the majority of people, but the majority of courts have recognized that gay marriage is not a civil right. The majority of people believe that it's a civil wrong. Same-sex unions are not marriages. And yes, you have the right to live as you choose. You may even need some may benefits even. or some protections. But you do not have the right to redefine marriage. Yeah, but see, we're not redefining you marriage. You are, sure. Evan. You have Please to be don't in reality. Interrupt. Please don't interrupt. For I the majority of Americans, for a majority of the Americans, you are same groups that funnel their marriage. money through Maggie Gallagher's organization are opposed to partnerships and civil unions and every other level of respect. Maggie, is it true that you oppose civil unions as well? The National Organization for Marriage does not take a direct issue on civil unions. However, we would if it were in So if there were a ballot issue that said gays can have civil unions, would you back off and stay out? Let me just say, our focus is on the marriage issue and on the religious liberty consequences of other kinds of benefits and protections. Right, and what I said was that the same funders who are funneling their money through this organization are opposed to partnerships and every other measure Evan, of respect. the National Organization I of finish? Marriage. I have fought for the marriage issue for 25 years, Evan, <laughs> because I believe the ideal for a child is a married mother and father. Marriage is not a relationship invented by the government. Marriage is a social institution with deep roots in nature. Listen, Mrs. Gallagher, you're entitled to believe whatever you want. You what don't I said is that. that the funders no, who funnel their money through. That is Stop not interrupting, true, please. You're under investigation for violating campaign laws in three states, and you know that. We obey the laws of this country. Then why are you under investigation for flouting those laws? Your Honor, the plaintiffs are in the same position as Mildred Jeter and Richard Loving, who in 1967 had no interest in diluting the institution of marriage. They only wanted to marry the person they loved, the person of their choice, who happened to be a person of a different race. That's all the plaintiffs desire, the right to marry the person they love, the person of their choice, who happens to be of the same sex. Well, now, the Supreme Court decided that the issue 
which we are confronted with here, was not ripe for the Supreme Court to weigh in on. That was 1972. What's happened in the 38 years since 1972? The Supreme Court in Lawrence versus Texas reversed Bowers versus Hardwick with a six to three decision. And the majority of that opinion, Justice Kennedy and four other justices, decided that case on the basis of due process. The statute in Lawrence was a criminal statute. Yes. The denial of the right to marriage of same-sex couples doesn't have any criminal sanction. I submit it doesn't make any difference. Our fundamental rights cannot be taken away unless the state has a very, very fundamental, strong, compelling reason to do so. And it acts with surgical precision so that it takes no more than the compelling reason justifies. We're talking about a group of individuals who meet every one of the standards for suspect classification. They are a minority. There wasn't any dispute about that. It's an immutable characteristic. The witnesses said that. I was a, uh, a very precocious kid. So one day I ended up looking up the word homosexual in the dictionary. Something along the lines of a romantic attraction between members of the same sex. And it slowly dawned on me that that's what I was. So given your prior testimony about homosexuals, how did you feel when you realized that you were gay? Well, once I realized what a homosexual was, I, I was scared by that. I realized that this was bad news for me, so I, I hid it as far away from everyone as I could. And around this time, did you talk to anyone about being gay? When I was in the seventh grade, I remember being taunted about being gay. I was called faggot, I was called a homo, a queer. It was scary going into that building, realizing these kids were taunting me with a word that was so close to the truth. I, I would go home crying. Did your parents ever find out that you were gay? When I was 13 years old, my parents discovered my journal. And for the first time, I had admitted to myself that I was gay. And I had actually written those words. And they found that and read it. And what happened when they read that journal? They were very upset. They were yelling. I remember my mother looking at me and telling me that I was going to burn in hell. It, it was shocking. I had, uh, I had never heard anything like that from my mother. I mean, you don't get much worse than eternal damnation. And what is NARTH? NARTH stands for the National Association for Reparative Therapy of Homosexuality. It's a reversal therapy or organization based in Encino, California. Mm -hmm. And how long were you at NARTH? From what ages? 14 to 16. And during the time that you were at NARTH, how was your home life? Um... My, uh, my mother would tell me that she hated me. Once she told me that she wished she had had an abortion instead of a gay son. Uh, she told me that she'd wish I had been born, born with Down syndrome or that I had been mentally retarded. Who did you meet with at North? I met with Dr. Joseph Nikolowski. Where would you meet with Mr. Nikolowski? I, I did actually fly out to California to do in-person sessions. I recall Nikolowski saying that you know, homosexuality is incompatible with what God wants for you and, and your parents want you to change and that this was a bad thing. And were you given any advice on how you would be able to suppress your homosexuality in these therapy sessions? I remember it was a general admonishment, but not a specific technique, no. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Cooper, you may cross-examine. Mr. Kendall, have you ever lived in the state of California? No, I have not. You've never read a scientific study addressing the concept of sexual orientation, isn't that true? That is true. And isn't it also true that you have never studied whether a person's sexual orientation can change throughout the course of his or her lifetime? No, I, I haven't studied it. And nothing involved in this conversion therapy was your decision. It was all your parents' decision, isn't that true? Yes. And at some point, you communicated to your parents your objections to the counseling treatment, but your parents compelled you to go against your will. That is correct. Your only goal for conversion therapy was to survive the experience. Isn't that true? Absolutely true. You didn't have the goal of changing your sexual orientation. I'm sorry, correction. You didn't have the goal of changing your sexual attraction. Is that correct? That's correct. Indeed, you admit that you did not truly want to reduce your sexual attraction to persons of the same sex. Isn't that true? That's correct. It's my experience that people don't want to go to programs like NARTH. Well. 
You acknowledged in your deposition, did you not, that some people report to have effective results with this conversion therapy. Isn't that true? Yes. I have no further questions, Your Honor. And was this therapy successful in that you were able to suppress your homosexuality? Nope, I was just as gay as when I started. <laughs> While you were in conversion therapy, were you introduced to any people who purported or were purported to you to have successfully undergone conversion therapy? I remember during one of the group therapy sessions, Nikoloski trotted out his perfect patient, the, the guy who had been cured of his homosexuality, and, and his name was Kelly. And did meeting Kelly have any impact on your views of conversion therapy? I remember once when Nikoloski stepped out of the room, we were talking amongst ourselves, and Kelly told me that later that night he was going to a gay bar. <laughs> and that he was just pretending to be cured for the sake of his family. And why did you stop going to reversal therapy? During this whole thing, my life had kind of fallen apart. I didn't have the world that I grew up in. My faith, which was very important to me. My family, which was even more important to me. Everything had just kind of stopped, and I just couldn't take any more. And I realized at one point that if I didn't stop going, I, I wasn't going to survive. What did you mean by that? Um, I, would have, I would have probably killed myself. Your Honor. Our submission, obviously, is that sexual orientation is not an immutable trait, that it is, it is an accident, an accident of birth, which... What, what which, do you mean, an accident of birth? An accident of birth in the sense that the term has been used consistently by the Supreme Court to identify the kinds of immutable characteristics that go into the calculus on whether heightened scrutiny should apply. The Ninth Circuit Court in the High Tech Gays case said, unequivocally, sexual orientation is not an immutable characteristic. That is a quote but perhaps the most vivid evidence was an APA study which indicated that over a 10-year period for women who identified themselves as homosexuals, some two-thirds of them had experienced a change in their sexual orientation at least once over the course of their lifetime. I had a hard time relating to the concept of being in love when I was married to my husband. I honestly just couldn't relate to people when they said they were in love. I thought they were overstating their feelings. <laughs> Making a big deal out of something. It, it just seemed dramatic. When you grow up in the Midwest and in a farming family, there's a pragmatism that's part of the fabric of life. And I remember as a young girl talking to my mom about love and marriage, and, and she would say, you know, marriage is more than romantic love. It's more than excitement. It's hard work. <laughs> and uh, in my family, that seemed really true. <laughs> um, so I thought that's what I was signing up for when I got married to him. Not that it would be bad, but that it would be hard work. When I first met Chris, I was teaching a computer class, and she was a student. But then we ended up being friends, and I began to realize that the feelings I had for her were really unique, and they were absolutely <laughs> taking over my thoughts and my entire self. And I grew to realize I had a very strong attraction to her and that I was falling in love with her. And not only were we in love, but we wanted to join our families and have the kind of life of commitment and stability that we both really appreciated. How convinced are you that you are gay? You've lived with a husband. You said you loved him. Some people might say, well, it's this, and then it's that, and it could be this again. I'm convinced because at 47 years old, I have fallen in love one time, and it is with Chris. I have been gay as long as I can remember. I have no uh, attraction desire to be with a member of the opposite sex. I have always felt strong attraction and interest in women, and I have only ever fallen in love with women. I'm 45 years old. I don't think I'm anything other 
than gay. The American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, the major professional mental health associations have all gone on record affirming that homosexuality is a normal expression of sexuality. Finding, Finding of fact number 46. Individuals do not generally choose their sexual orientation. No credible evidence supports a finding that an individual may, through conscious decision, uh, therapeutic intervention, or any other method, change his or her sexual orientation. Professor Herrick, can you please describe your educational background? Yes, I received my doctorate in social psychology from the University of California. My dissertation focused on heterosexuals' attitudes towards lesbians and gay men. And turning your opinions, Dr. Herrick, what is sexual orientation? Sexual orientation is a term we use to describe an enduring sexual, romantic, or intensely affectional attraction to men, to women, or to both men and women. It's used to refer to an identity or a sense of self that is based on one's enduring patterns of attraction. So is homosexuality considered a mental disorder? No. There were empirical studies that had been conducted that had failed to support the view of homosexuality as a mental illness. Okay, looking at the study, the definition and scope of sexual orientation. It says, we suggest the term sexual preference is misleading as it assumes conscious or deliberate choice and may trivialize the depth of the psychological process involved. We recommend the term sexual orientation because findings indicate that homosexuals' feelings are, basic, are a basic part of an individual's psyche and are established much earlier than conscious choice would indicate. Do you agree with that? Yes. <clears throat> yes, I do. But these immutability characteristics, they really are not the important factor are they, in deciding what the level of scrutiny is? Well, Your, Your Honor, yes, with respect, it is a critical, it, it, is, it is a critical element, but it isn't, it isn't more or different, differently critical than, say, political power. And, Your Honor, under the Supreme Court's test for political powerlessness, we would submit to you again that the evidence is overwhelming that gays and lesbians are not politically powerless, notwithstanding Dr. Segura's testimony. Dr. Segura, how have ballot initiatives in this country affected the rights of gay men and lesbians in terms of political power? Well, for starters, I would include in this undocumented aliens who are a distant second. There is no group who has been targeted by ballot initiatives more than gays and lesbians. The number of ballot initiative contests since the late 1970s is probably at or above 200. Gays and lesbians lose 70% of the contests and 100% of the contents, con, con, contests over same-sex marriage and adoption. Are gays and lesbians underrepresented in political office in the United States? At last count, only six people have ever served in the House of Representatives who have been openly gay, and only two of those were elected as openly gay. There has never been an openly gay senator or cabinet member, or certainly president. And only about 1% of the state's legislatures are gay. So how does the lack of participation or representation in government positions undermine the political power of gay men and lesbians? There are members of the United States Senate who in public speeches have compared same-sex marriages to marrying a box turtle. Senator Coburn has gone on record saying that the gay and lesbian agenda is the greatest threat to the freedom in the United States today. And a senator from South Carolina said that gays and lesbians shouldn't be allowed to teach in the public schools. It's difficult to imagine an elected official saying such a thing about really almost any other citizen group. Now, that's not the fringe. That's the United States senator. And as a consequence, it legitimizes some of these deeply hostile beliefs. I don't want to draw people's criticism. In fact, quite the opposite. I would really like people to like me. <laughs> I would. So since I know I have this trait that I can't change, that people don't like, I go to great lengths to develop other, other traits that people will like. So I put a significant amount of time and energy into being, well, likable. <laughs> so 
so that when discriminatory things happen, maybe I can turn it around. The decision every day to come out or not at work, at home, at PTA, at music, at soccer, it's, it's exhausting. If, for example, I'm on a plane and somebody comes up and I've saved a seat for Sandy, but she's not there yet, and they say, is that saved? And I say, yes, it's for my partner. And they say, oh, well then, could you please move so I could sit there? Or if, if we're at a store and people want to know if we're sisters or cousins or friends, and I have to decide every day if I want to come out everywhere I go and take the chance that somebody will have a hostile reaction or just go there and buy the microwave we went there to buy without having to go through all that again. <sighs> Let me throw in a question here. Assume I agree with you that the state's interest in marriage is essentially procreative. How does permitting same-sex marriages impair or adversely affect that interest? Your Honor, that gets to the fundamental disagreement there. They say that it's not enough for opposite-sex unions to further and advance these vital state interests, that we have to prove that including same-sex unions into the definition of marriage would actually harm those purposes and interests. That is not equal protection I am asking you to tell me how it would harm opposite-sex marriages. All right. All right. Let's play on the same playing field for once, okay? Your Honor, my answer... My answer is... I don't know. I... I don't know. Does that mean, does that mean if this is not determined to be subject to rational basis review, you lose? No, Your Honor. Just haven't figured out how you're going to win on that basis yet. Your Honor, <laughs> by saying that the state and its electorate are entitled, when dealing with radical proposals for change, to move with caution. Keep in mind, this same-sex marriage is a very recent innovation. Its implications of a social and cultural nature, uh, not to mention its impact on marriage over time, can't possibly be known. So this is a political question, and the court should abstain? Is that it? Same-sex marriage. Have you really thought about it? What it means when gay marriage conflicts with our religious freedoms. Why it was forced on us by San Francisco judges when gay domestic partners already have the same legal rights. What it means when our children are taught about it in school. Have you thought about what same-sex marriage means? To me? Think about it. Voting yes restores traditional marriage. Yes on Proposition 8. I was in traffic in Los Angeles, and that's like having coffee with someone in the car next to you. <clears throat> you deal with sitting next to this person over and over again for miles. And I noticed that this person had a Yes on 8 campaign sticker on their bumper. And I thought, I want to see who this person is. And I pulled up, and I looked over, and I got a very distinctive what look back. And I said, I just disagree with your bumper sticker. She said, well, marriage is not for you people anyway. And I thought, God, do I have a gay flag on my car? Like, like how does she even know I'm gay? And, and normally I think I'm, I'm pretty good about being able to come back with, you know, something to, to, to support myself. But I was in shock. And, and I remember it was a yellow bumper sticker, and it had an image that looked like a parent and a child connected because protect the children was a big part of their campaign. But when I think of protecting your children, you protect them from people who will perpetrate crimes against them. You protect yourself from, from things that can harm you physically, emotionally. And the insinuation that I would be a part of that category, that, that my getting married to Jeff is going to harm some child somewhere, it, it's so damning and it's, it's so angering because if you put my nieces and nephews on the stand right now, I'd be the cool uncle. <laughs> and to think that you had to protect someone from me, from Jeff, from our friends and from our community, there's no recovering from that. 
And unless you've experienced that moment, regardless of how proud you are, you feel ashamed. It rocks your world. I'm willing to acknowledge that there are plenty of good Californians that voted for Proposition 8 because they are not, well, let's say they are uncomfortable with gay people. They're uncomfortable with gay people entering into marriage, and they're uncomfortable with the very idea that gay people are just like us. But they didn't hear, and too bad they couldn't have seen the evidence in this trial. The Supreme Court has said that marriage is the most important relation in life. It is the foundation of society. It is essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness. It is a right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights and older than all of our political parties, a right of intimacy to the degree of being sacred. There are 14 Supreme Court decisions that talk about the right of marriage and the testimony of all these expert witnesses and the testimony of the plaintiffs. That erects an insurmountable barrier to the proponents of this proposition. It will not hurt Californians. It will benefit Californians. But as long as it doesn't hurt Californians to get rid of a handful, or let's say a harmful stigma in their constitution that's labeling people into classes, then it's unconstitutional. Thank you, Your Honor. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Olson. We have come to lunchtime, and Mr. Cooper, you were up at 1 o'clock, and I look forward to hearing from you at that time. It's not discrimination. It's not discrimination to treat different things differently. I have a message for our good friends who don't agree with us. The 52% of Californians who came together across lines of race and creed and color to protect marriage as the union of husband and wife are not haters. There is rather powerful evidence that human beings are a two-sex species designed for sexual rather than asexual reproduction. If this is true, then the absence of desire for the opposite sex represents, at a minimum, a sexual dysfunction. Spencer, aren't you hungry? Uh, no, not really. I can't miss practice again and still start on Friday. Yeah, and, and I have a test. Three tests, actually. How long do we have to be here? At its deepest level, this thing called marriage stands for the reality that our bodies have meaning, that it's not an accident that we are born male and female, that the deepest yearnings of our hearts and even our bodies have a purpose. A baby, as you know, is God's opinion that the world should go on. It is not a creature of government, something invented and reinvented for the latest fad. But I mean, they're not really doing anything in there. They're just providing lots and lots of dense evidence. I mean, I just hear it and I'm like, uh, okay, who cares? <laughs> you know, I thought it was interesting personally, but they're side, they're, they're just, they're so... Subpar, Spencer. Subpar, th- that's the perfect word. Thank you, Elliot. <laughs> and it's nothing we don't know already, so why are we here? What are activist judges proposing to do? to redefine what the word husband means, to redefine what the word wife means, to redefine what the word parent means, so that no longer has these deep roots in the natural order. Hey, we'll get tapas at Fana's on our way home. How about that? Whatever. We'll just get takeout and walk home. Oh, your moms, huh? It's the special kind of torture to be like at a restaurant with your moms, right? It's not that bad. I I think you're interesting, Sandy. (laughs) Just one more night and we'll be back to normal. And you'll be really, really bored again, I promise. (laughs) So what is this thing called same-sex marriage? I'll tell you what it is. It amounts to a vast social experiment on children. And rewriting the basic rules of marriage puts all children, not just the children in unisex unions, at risk. And that's the real truth. Thank you very much. (laughs) Mr. Cooper, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. The New York Court of Appeals observed in 2006 that until quite recently it was an accepted truth for almost everyone who lived in a society in which marriage existed that there could be marriages only between participants of different sex. So the first question is, why has marriage been so universally defined by virtually all societies at all times in human history as an exclusively opposite sex institution? It is 
because marriage serves a societal pur purpose that is equally ubiquitous, a purpose that makes marriage fundamental to the very existence and survival of the human race. And the historical record leaves no doubt that the central purpose of marriage in virtually all societies and at all times has been to channel potentially procreative sexual relations into enduring stable unions to increase the likelihood that any offspring will be raised by a man and woman who brought them into the world. Mr. Olson often quotes the Supreme Court's statement that marriage creates the most important relation in life. That quote comes from the Maynard case, and the Maynard court explained why the institution of marriage is uniquely imbued with public interest. Do people get married to benefit the community? Your Honor? When one enters into a marriage, you don't say, oh boy, I'm going to be able to benefit society by getting married. <laughs> what you think of is, I'm going to get a life partner. Yes, Your Honor. Somebody that I can share my life with, maybe have children. But all sorts of things come out of a marriage. Yeah, but if you... But is this the purpose of marriage for indivi individuals to benefit society? Well, it may well be that individuals who get married aren't doing it in order to benefit the community, although that is the ultimate result of it. But the question has to be, well, why does the government regulate this relationship? That's a good why? question. Why doesn't it leave it entirely up to private contract? It is because this relationship is crucial to the public interest, because, Your Honor... The procreative sexual relation is an enormous benefit to society, and it represents a very real threat to society's interests. A threat. A threat. A threat in the sense that to whatever extent children are born into the world without this stable, enduring marital unit and, 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 and raised by both of the parents that brought them into this world, then a host of very, very negative social implications arise. But the state doesn't withhold the right to marriage to people who are unable to produce children of their own. Are you suggesting that the state should? No. No, Your Honor, no. It, it, it is by no means a necessary, a, a, a necessary condition or a necessary requirement. Well, then the state must have some interest wholly apart from procreation. Your Honor, it isn't a necessary requirement that the state actually insist that individuals who get married have children or be able to have children. How... How would it go about administering such a requirement? It would be, we have to have a pre, pre, premarital fertility testing, some kind of premarital pledge in which the couple found to be fertile, some kind of intrusive process, also pledged to actually have children. Uh, Your Honor, I, the, the, these kinds of Orwellian, or, Orwellian... It is Orwellian, but isn't that the logic that flows from the premise that marriage is about procreation? It is enough if the state or the society seeks to attempt to ensure and increase the likelihood. Really, that's what it boils down to. Increase the likelihood that naturally procreative sexual relationships will take place in an enduring and stable family environment for the sake of raising children. Isn't the state indifferent with respect to how the child was conceived? The state and every state and every society for the millennia, Your Honor, has attempted to channel naturally procreative sexual conduct between men and women into an enduring, stable union for the sake Let's of... Let's move on from the millennia to the three weeks of, in January when we had the trial. <laughs> what does the evidence show? Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I, I believe the evidence shows overwhelmingly that this interest in what many call, and, and the United States Congress calls, responsible procreation is really at the heart of society's interest in regulating marriage. Okay. Because, for example, what the evidence shows is that... I'm just... What was the witness who offered the testimony? What was it? And so forth. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, sociologist Kingsley Davis has described the universal societal interest in marriage as recognition and approval of a couple engaging in sexual intercourse and marrying and rearing offspring. Blackstone, Your Honor said that there are two great relations in private life. First, that of husband and wife. I don't mean to be flipped, but Blackstone didn't testify. Kingsley Davis didn't testify. What testimony in this case supports the proposition? But, Your Honor, you don't have to have evidence for this from these authorities. This is in the cases themselves. I don't have to have evidence. <laughs> you don't... 
you don't have to have evidence of, the, of this point if one court after another. Your Honor, most courts, most of the courts, at least two-thirds, Your Honor, or, or, or just approximately anyway, two-thirds of all the judges that have looked at this issue before you have, have upheld the traditional or would have would have upheld the traditional definition of marriage on this rationale. This, this, this rationale. And the plaintiffs say there is no way to understand why anyone would support Proposition 8 except through some irrational, dark motivation, some animus, some, some kind of bigotry. Your Honor, that is just not only a slur on 7 million Californians who supported Proposition 8, it is a slur on 70 out of 108 judges who have. If you have got 7 million Californians who took this position, 70 judges, as you pointed out, and this long history that you have described, why in this case did you present but one witness on the subject? One witness. And I think it fair to say that his testimony was equivocal in some respects. The defense in this case started with a long list of witnesses. But you see, it's easy for people who want to deprive gays and lesbians of their rights to make all kinds of statements in campaign literature or on TV where they can't be cross-examined. But when they have to come into court and defend those opinions under oath, well, initial depositions, their expert witnesses started having second thoughts. That included Dr. William Tam, one of the very men who worked to put Proposition 8 on the ballot in the first place. What is your relationship to the traditional family coalition? I am the executive director of traditional family coalition. All right, this is an email that you wrote on May 15th, 2008. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the last sentence of this says, we can't lose the battle for Proposition 8 or God's definition of marriage will be permanently erased in California. Now, was that your motivation for participating with protectmarriage.com in promoting Proposition 8? Hmm. The other reason is, I think it is very important that our children do not grow up thinking, fantasizing, or thinking about, should I marry Jane or John when I grow up? Then you go on to say, what will be next? On their agenda list is legalizing having sex with children. And this was something that you were putting in, out in order to convince people to vote for Proposition 8. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. And then the last sentence says, if sexual orientation is characterized as a civil right, then so would pedophilia, polygamy, and incest. Do you agree with that, sir? Yes, I agree. And that's what you were telling people in order to convince them to vote for Proposition 8. Is that correct? Yes. Let me go down to point four, where you say that countries that legalized same-sex marriage saw alarming moral decline. You believe that after the Netherlands legalized same-sex marriage, the Netherlands went on after that to legalize incest and polygamy and... I mean, who told you that, sir? It's in the internet. In the internet. And you just put it out there to convince voters to vote for Proposition 8. Yeah. <laughs> After his deposition, Dr. Cham chose to avoid the subpoenas compelling him to appear in court under oath. In effect, Dr. Tam went on the lam, <laughs> refusing to testify. And after our depositions of their potential witnesses were complete, only two, two were still willing to testify. Their only remaining expert on marriage was a Mr. Blankenhorn. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Blankenhorn, what is the primary purpose of marriage in human groups? 
We're embodied as male and female. That's the basic division in the species. We, we reproduce sexually. In fact, the famous anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss once described marriage as a social institution with a biological foundation. He was saying that across societies, that the man and the woman whose sexual union makes the child, that those same two individuals are also the social and legal parents of the child. And there is only one institution in the world that performs the task of bringing together the three dimensions of parenthood, the biological, the social, and the legal. That institution is marriage because we know how important this is for children. Very well. Mr. Boyce, you may cross-examine. Well, all right. Uh, let me try to make this as simple as I can. <laughs> Have any of, the, any of the scholars that you've said you relied on said that permitting same-sex marriage will cause a reduction in heterosexual marriages? That's yes, no, or I don't know. I know the answer. I cannot answer you correctly if the only words I'm allowed to choose from is yes or no. I can give you my answer in a very brief sentence. If you know the answer, why don't you share it with us? I, well, I would be happy to, but he's only permitting me to give yes and no. I, and I, <laughs> well, I cannot do that and be accurate. He is giving you three choices. Yes, no, I don't know. But I do know. I do know the answer. Then is it yes or is it no? Your, Your Honor, I can answer the question, but I cannot give an accurate answer if the only two choices I have are yes and no. I, if you give me a sentence, I can answer it. So one sentence is all I'm asking for. All right. Let's take a sentence. One sentence. Can you ask me the question again, please? <laughs> yes. Have any of the scholars who you say you relied on asserted that they believe permitting same-sex marriage will result in a reduction in the heterosexual marriage rate? <clears throat> My answer is that I believe that some of the scholars I have cited have asserted that permitting same-sex marriage would contribute to the deinstitutionalization of marriage, one of the manifest manifestations of which would be a lower marriage rate among heterosexuals, but I do not have sure knowledge that in the exact form of words you are asking me for, they have made the direct assertion that permitting same-sex marriage would directly lower the marriage rate among Mr. heterosexuals. Mr. Blankenhorn. That wasn't that long. Questions and answers. If I were to take that as an I don't know, would that be fair? <laughs> well, with, res with res respect, Your Honor, I would disagree with you. I know exactly my answer to this question, and I have just stated it, and I would be happy to restate it. The record is clear on what you said. <laughs> Your Honor, if you will, I want to address the issue of whether or not there is a legitimate basis for people to be concerned that redefining the traditional understanding of marriage presents any basis for concern about the harm that, that may result. But before analyzing this, I think we have to begin with two propositions. The first one is that redefining the institution will change the institution. And I think Mr. Blankenhorn really summed it up quite well. It's impossible to be completely sure about a prediction of future events. But I do have a great deal of confidence in the likelihood of the weakening of marriage through the process of deinstitutionalization to a greater degree than would be the case otherwise. If you change the definition of the thing, it's hard to imagine how it could have no impact on the thing. So while I don't think anyone here can say that they know from scientific study that they that they know with absolute certainty that this will happen, I sincerely believe that this is the most, this, this is a likely outcome, a likely result of adopting same-sex marriage. <laughs> and when you say 
based on the scholars that have studied this. That's because you're simply repeating the things that these scholars say. You're just a transmitter of the findings of these scholars. Is well, that correct? Now you're, you're putting words in my mouth. No, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I was simply trying to report the view of some scholars that I was basing my arguments on. I'm saying there are scholars, respected scholars, who have made this argument based on ethnographic research, and I've read them, and that's the basis for my assertion. Your that's Honor, could I ask this witness be instructed to listen to the question, answer my question, and not make a statement that is not responsive to the question, even if he believes it's important? I don't need such instruction. That's what, that, my intention is to do exactly that. <laughs> Mr. Blankenhorn. One of the instructions that the court gives to the jury when an expert witness testifies is to consider the witness's background, training, and all the other evidence in the case. And that other evidence includes the demeanor of the witness. So I would urge you to pay close attention to Mr. Boyce's questions and to answer them directly, succinctly. So bear that in mind. Yes, sir, I will. I'm really just addressing whether I was putting words in your mouth. Uh, if you look at page 300, lines 7 through 12, you said that you were basing your analysis on the work of highly regarded scholars, and then you say... Okay, oh, I got gotcha you moment. <laughs> I used the word, I'm a transmitter of findings of eminent scholars. Gotcha. No, that's okay. not a gotcha. Okay. I'm just trying to... <laughs> okay. I said transmitter seven months ago in a deposition. And what you meant there was that you weren't making these conclusions on your own. You were simply repeating what these scholars had to say. Is that correct? If I may say so well, in my own words? Let me uh, well, look at your basing... own words. Let's look at your own words. Page 300. I am simply repeating things that they say. I can assure you these are not my own conclusions. I am, I'm, I'm a transmitter here of findings. <laughs> Of findings of these eminent scholars. Did you give that testimony at your deposition? That's what I said at the deposition. <laughs> your Honor, you will not find anywhere in the pages of history, nowhere, any suggestion that the traditional definition of marriage across cultures, across time, had anything whatever to do with homosexuality. Had nothing to do with it. You heard Mr. Olson this morning recount the background of the loving decision by the Supreme Court in 1967. And up to that time, numerous states had laws on the books which prohibited interracial marriage. Why are we not at that same tipping point here with respect to same-sex marriage? Your Honor, several reasons. Uh, among the most important is this. What legitimate purpose of marriage recognized historically or anywhere else provided a rational basis for the state of Virginia to say that an interracial couple could not get married? It certainly wasn't core procreative purpose. Excuse me for interrupting, but you recall the rationale that was used by the courts was that the mixing of the racist would have serious corrosive effects on society. Uh, Your Honor, those racist, racist sentiments and policies had no foundation in the historical purpose of marriage. And in fact, they actually made people have illegitimate children, illegitimate natural children, which again was the, pur the purpose of marriage, as Justice Stevens says, is to license cohabitation and produce legitimate children. As the Eighth Circuit said, Your Honor, only opposite-sex couples can procreate naturally, and therefore, it is only opposite-sex couples who uniquely address this fundamental but historic... But you don't draw any distinction between the state's interests where an opposite-sex couple have had to require some form of intervention in order to produce children? The state's interest is exactly the same, is it not? Your Honor, not. They are not quite the same, no. Well, then what's the difference? Well, I really think the state's main concern, or certainly among the state's main concerns in regulating marriage and in seeking to channel naturally procreative sexual conduct into stable and enduring unions is to minimize what I call irresponsible procreation. It's not a good term, <laughs> but I, I can't think of a more serviceable one. And th that is procreation that isn't bound by social norms and that often leads to children being raised by one parent or the other, or sometimes neither parent. And my point was that there are a number of heterosexual couples who do not naturally procreate, who require the intervention of some third party or some medical assistance of some kind. <laughs> yes, Your Honor, and it is not those opposite sex couples either that the state is concerned about in terms of, in terms of the threats to society and the concerns that society has from irresponsible procreation. 
why don't those same values you have described apply to lesbian couples and gay couples? Coming together, supporting one another, providing love, comfort, and support for one another, why don't all of those considerations apply just as much to the plaintiffs here as they apply to John and Jane Doe? Your Honor, Your Honor, I, 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 I want to conclude this piece of my argument by calling the Court's attention to a case from the 11th Circuit called Lofton. It was a case in which the 11th Circuit upheld a Florida statute that prohibited gay adoptions. Taking all of this available information into account, the legislature could, ra could rationally conclude that a family environment with married opposite-sex parents remains the optimum social structure in which to bear children, and that the raising of children by same-sex couples presents ad an alternative structure for child-rearing that has not yet proven itself to be as optimal I want to ask as the biologically-based marriage norm. I'd like to ask you something. Why should Mr. Blankenhorn's testimony be admitted? Does he meet the Daubert standard? <laughs> His professional life for 20 years has been devoted to the study of one subject, the subject of marriage. He's written two books on this subject. Are they peer-reviewed? I, I think the Ninth Circuit standards for qualifying an expert are particularly liberal, and I don't think that they require that. They, they certainly don't insist that an expert's publications have been peer-reviewed. So, Your Honor, again, I, I, I really didn't come All right. here to particularly re-argue that, but I, I do believe, I, I <laughs> would the court entertain, uh, well, a break, uh, maybe five minutes. <laughs> Why don't we take a little more than that and resume at 10 minutes after the hour? What did that mean? What? Irresponsible procreation? Illegitimate natural children? What's he talking about in there? They're going to say whatever they have to. It doesn't mean it's true or that it's about you. You two s certainly weren't accidents. God, no. So, so he was talking about us. I mean, me and Elliot, specifically. To our faces. Spencer, it's not... Technically, no, I... his back was to us, Spence. <laughs> he didn't even say it to our faces. When I was 21 and she was 19, my sister was diagnosed with inoperable brain cancer. The summer I graduated from college, she died. I was the only biological child my parents had left. Losing Karen changed us all, not necessarily for the best. We all fumbled through the sadness for years after that. It really felt like we'd be devastated and broken forever. My 20s were so wrapped up in grieving and healing, but I eventually came out of it. And when I did, I felt crystal clear that I wanted a family. I wanted to give birth. I wanted to feel connected to my kids the way I had to my parents and Karen when she was alive. I was unequivocal, unequivocal in my desire to have kids and bring the best parts of my sister our family, and our future together. The rest is pretty typical. My partner of seven years and I started the process of learning how to get pregnant. Yes, lesbians have to learn how. I went to a Considering Parenthood class for lesbians. We chose a donor. We started inseminating. And after a year and a half, I decided to use fertility medication. And that's when it worked. I got pregnant the spring of 1994. I was eight months pregnant on my 30th birthday and bigger than our little house. You boys were born at UCSF on October 30th by C-section. I will not give you the OR details. <laughs> but you were not accidents. You were not irresponsible. You two are about the most responsible, important, meaningful things I will ever do in my whole life. And don't you ever let anyone ever make you feel any different. You got it? Yes, Mom. Yes, Mom. But we still don't want to get out tonight. Fine, tacos, take out whatever you want. <laughs> hey, it's our turn. If you want to hear the rest, we should go back in. Come on. Mm. 
Now, you believe that gays and lesbians today are raising children, correct? Of course, yes. And in fact, hundreds of thousands of children are being raised by gay and lesbian couples, is that correct? I don't know how many. Did you ever try to find out? I did. And were you able to make an approximation? I was. Yes, sir, I was. <laughs> and what was that approximation? I can't recall. <laughs> Can you recall approximately? No, sir. Okay. And you recognize that in some cases, gay and lesbians are raising a child that is the biological child of one of the parents, and in some cases, they are raising adopted children. That's correct? Those would be two... two of, yeah, of course they would be. Those, those would be examples of... Th those would be examples of children in gay and lesbian homes, yes. And you believe that permitting gay and lesbian couples to marry would significantly advantage the gays and the lesbians themselves and the children that they are raising. Is that correct, sir? When you say advantage, do you mean improve the well-being of? Yes. My... The answer to your question is <laughs> that I believe that adopting same-sex marriage would be likely to imp improve the well-being of gay and lesbian households and their children. In fact, the studies show that all things being equal, two adoptive parents raising a child from birth will do as well as two biological parents raising a child from birth, correct? No, sir, that's incorrect. Well, sir... Well, may, may I say another word on we'll that? We'll have an please? opportunity to redirect. Okay, well, it was a clarifying thing and it actually supports something you just said. The studies show that adoptive parents, um, because of the rigorous screening process that they undertake before becoming adoptive parents, actually on some outcomes, outstrip the biological parents in terms of providing protective care for their children. Yes, I was going to come to that. I appreciate you for getting there. <laughs> now, in Binder number one, we have a copy of your book, Future of Marriage. And the last two sentences. After all, part of the reason why the principle is so revolutionary is that it can grow and deepen over time. Groups that had long been considered effectively outside its moral reach, African Americans, women, people of certain colors or languages or religions, can over time, and often as a result of great struggle, enter into its protective sphere. And then you get to two sentences I want to particularly direct your attention to. You say, I believe that today the principle of equal human dignity must apply to gay and lesbian persons. You see that? Yes, yes sir. Yep. And the I there is you, correct? Th that's correct. <laughs> and you say that in that sense, insofar as we are a nation founded on this principle, we would be more, emphasize more, American on the day we permitted same-sex marriage than we were on the day before. And you wrote those words, did you not, sir? I wrote those words. You believe them to be correct? Yes, uh, yes, I now believe them. That's correct. <laughs> Your Honor, I have no more questions. when they, they come into court and they have to support and defend their opinions under oath and cross-examination, those opinions, they just melt away. There simply wasn't any evidence. There weren't any empirical studies. It's made up. It's junk science. And it's easy to say that on television, 
But the witness stand is a lonely place to lie. And when you come into court, you can't do that. And that's what we did. We put fear and prejudice on trial. Your Honor, Mr. Blagonord's testimony was utterly unnecessary for this proposition. Utterly unnecessary for this proposition. This goes back to the you don't need any evidence point. <laughs> Mr. Cooper, carry on. The plaintiffs think that the consequences dominantly will be good consequence, but is not something that they can possibly prove. And we would submit to you, because I have heard this and read this more than any three words that I have ever spoken, I don't know. I don't know how many times I wish I could have taken those words back. Well? Because, Your Honor, whatever your question is, I damn sure know there's a risk. And we want to see what happens in Massachusetts. We want to see what happens right here and elsewhere. But the I don't know or we don't know where it's going to lead answer, is that enough to impose upon some citizens a restriction that others do not suffer from? We don't have to prove that redefining marriage to include same-sex marriage would visit harm upon the institution and the interests that it serves. Rather, we only have to prove that including same-sex couples would not serve those interests. The California Court of Appeals actually upheld the traditional definition of marriage, and one of the points it made, Your Honor, really goes to the heart of the matter. It is the proper role of the legislature, not the court, to fashion laws that serve competing public policies. There's a debate about the morals and the practicalities and the wis wisdom of this issue that really goes to the nature of our culture. And the Constitution should allow that debate to go forward among the people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Olson, why don't we just begin at that point that Mr. Cooper just left off with? And that is, in a sense, isn't the danger not that you're going to lose this case either here or at the Court of Appeals or at the Supreme Court, but that you might win it? Well, I think the case you're referring to has to do with abortion, Your Honor. It does indeed. Your Honor, the cases upon which we rely have been entirely different cases. They have relied on fundamental established constitutional law. Because the argument that Mr. Cooper makes is essentially the same argument that was made to the Loving Court, which, by the way, the Loving Court unanimously decided to strike down. And we stand here today thinking, how could that have been? In 1967, that's only 40 years or so ago, we would have punished as a felon in the state of Virginia the president's own mother and father if they had tried to travel there and be married. Now, Mr. Cooper's argument is, and I, I know why he would like to take back these words, we don't know. We don't have to prove anything. We don't have any evidence. Yet, he was reading from articles written by various persons who did not come into this courtroom and testify under oath, and who, who did not subject themselves to cross-examination by my colleague, Mr. Boyes. Some of them didn't come into court because they had been cross-examined by Mr. Boyes in their depositions. <laughs> But you do have to know. He does have to prove. The Romer Court specific, specifically says, under the lowest standard of review, you have to prove that you have a legitimate interest and that the subject, Proposition 8 in this case, advances that legitimate interest. So how does preventing same-sex couples from getting married advance the interest of procreation? What one single bit of evidence is there that they are a threat to the channeling function? If you accept that California has the right in the first place, and I do not, I believe, Your Honor, that there is a political tide turning. I think that people's eyes are being opened, finally. People are becoming more understanding and tolerant. The polls tell us that. There isn't any secret in that. But that does not justify a judge in a court to say, I really need the polls to be just a few inches higher. I need someone to go out and take the temperature of the American public before I can break this barrier and break down this discrimination. Because if they change it here in the next election in California, we still have Utah, we still have Missouri, and we still still have Montana. This case is going to go to a court. Some judge is going to have to decide what we've asked you to decide. And you have to have a reason, Your Honor, and you have to have a reason that's real. Not speculation, not built on stereotypes, and not hypothetical. That's what the Supreme Court decision tells us. And I submit 
At the end of the day, I don't know, and I don't have to put on any evidence, with all due respect to Mr. Cooper, does not cut it. It does not cut it when you're taking away the constitutional rights, basic human rights and human dignity from a large group of individuals. You cannot say after the fact, we are going to take away the constitutional right to liberty, privacy, association, and sexual intimacy that we already tell you you have. That is not acceptable. And it's not acceptable under our Constitution. And Mr. Blankenhorn is absolutely right. The day we end that, we will be more American. Thank you. So there is nothing further. Mr. Cooper. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Very well. The matter is submitted. <sighs> now what? I know, I know. It's too late for soccer, but we're going to go home. We'll just pick up food on the way, and you can study for your tests. Well, and what? We're, we're, we're just supposed to wait? Yeah, how long do we have to wait? Uh, I'm not sure, Elliot. Well, um, well, why not? I mean, you've got all these lawyers and, and people in suits running around. I mean, somebody's got to at least have an approximation of, of how long we have to wait. I mean, come on, give me a break. Come on, we'll fight these guys another day. You've got soccer practice tomorrow. You've got tests to study for. Fine, 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 fine. Mom? Mom. What? What is it? This whole thing was just ignorant. I hated being here. You're right. You're, you're right. You're, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have had to have been here. It's, it's my fault. Okay, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, Elliot, I am. I'm, I'm just... Let's just get out of here, okay? No. I just... I just remember when you were up there and looking around and... Seeing everyone crying around me, and not even realizing my, myself, but I was crying too. I mean, I just saw my mom up there fighting for us. And I'm glad I heard it. I am. I just hated that we had to. I know. That's all. I'm proud of you. I guess that's, that's what I'm saying. I love you, Mom. I love you too, honey. <laughs> On August 4th, 2010, Federal Judge Walker ruled unequivocally that California's gay marriage ban, Proposition 8, is unconstitutional. And on February 7th, 2012, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed that decision. It was a momentous victory for gay rights supporters, but it was not the end of the fight. It was the beginning of what promises to be a longer struggle and one destined for this country's highest court. Judge Walker's decision was stayed pending decisions by higher courts. So tonight, like millions of other Americans, Jeff Cirillo and Paul Katami, Sandy Steer and Chris Perry, still cannot be legally wed, their families still unrecognized and unprotected in the country they love. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The first time somebody said to me, are you married? And I said, yes. I would think that feels good and honest and true. I would feel less like I had to protect my kids or worried that they feel any shame or, or sense of not belonging? I shouldn't have to feel ashamed. Being gay doesn't make me any less American, it doesn't change my patriotism, it doesn't change the fact that I pay my taxes and I own a home and I want to start a family. I'd be able to stand alongside my parents and my brother and his wife. 
to be able to stand together as one family who have all had the opportunity of being married and the pride that one feels when that happens. If Prop 8 were undone and kids like me growing up in Bakersfield right now could never have to know what this felt like, their entire lives would be on a higher arc. They would live with a higher sense of themselves that would imp improve the quality of their entire life. And that's what I hope is the outcome of this case. I hope for something for Chris and I, but other people over time would benefit in such an even more profound, life-changing way. That's what I hope for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I want to introduce the author of tonight's play. You all know him, Dustin Lance Black. Come on up. Thank you guys for coming very much. This is the last leg in this race for full equality. That's what you always say. And thank you so much for supporting that today. We need your help to finish this fight at the U.S. Supreme Court. Thank you. Uh, we also want to acknowledge the actual plaintiffs who are here tonight. Jeff Cirillo, Paul Katami, Sandy Steers. Chris, Chris, where are you? Come on up. Oh, they're right here. Come on up. Chris Perry, Chris Perry, Sandy Steer. Paul Katami, Jeff Cirillo. Thank you, thank you. Everything you're doing is gonna push this over the finish line. We needed all of you, we needed everybody here. We needed the AFER team and Rob and Lance and Bruce and everybody, thank you. Boys, you wanna say something? All right, and last but definitely not least are two the most brilliant lawyers in the country. We have the two greatest lawyers that ever practiced law. Ted Olson and David Boyce. Come on up. Ted Olson, David Boyce. Come on up. Ted, go through here. Spencer and Elliot. Come on up. Spencer and Elliot. Spencer and Elliot.
thank you, thank you. Thank you for this incredible cast to take the words that took place during this trial and the emotions and to bring it to life before the American people. It's such a gratifying thing for David and I to be here. Um, it's just fantastic. It was beautiful to watch. Thank you. Yeah. There is a real poetic justice here because the defendants in the case have done everything they could and thus far successfully to keep the videotapes of the trial from the American people because they don't want people to understand what happened at that trial. They don't want people to understand what the record was. Now, if they had gone out, they probably would have gone out on C-SPAN. And I'm not sure how many people actually would have watched the entire trial. <laughs> but today, because of this presentation, because it's being streamed live on YouTube, millions of people around the world are going to have an opportunity to see in condensed form what the essence of this trial was like. And you have all seen that we did put fear and prejudice on trial and fear and prejudice lost. And Thank you very much. We'll see you. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Good night.